starting now. Um, and um, we'll, we'll get underway. Um, we want to thank you all so much for joining us this evening for our talk with Jennifer and Mac Watkins. Um, if you um, visit our YouTube channel, you can see an earlier talk we did with Jennifer as part of our Black Women of Print series of talks while we were closed due to COVID. Um, this is our third talk of the year. We do have others planned, so please visit our website at manhattangraphiccenter.org to learn more. Uh, while you're there, you'll be able to sign up for our mailing list and see our other events and course offerings. We just rolled out our summer classes. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to keep up to date. Um, if you're not familiar with our organization, Manhattan Graphic Center is a community print shop that supports the learning and practice of fine art printmaking. We provide an affordable, inclusive, professional studio and exhibition space. Plus, we offer classes and other public programs, including artist talks like this one, and also scholarships. Manhattan Graphic Center would like to thank the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, the New York State Council on the Arts, the Sherman Foundation, the Pierre and Tano Matisse Foundation, our members and our other donors and friends, all who make our artist talks and other programming possible. Uh, my name is Robin Sharon, and I'm joined by my colleagues, Kay Sarantonio and Anita Cardona. We're all part of our Manhattan Graphic Center for Person Management team, and we're very excited to welcome Jennifer to our artist talk series. Um, we'll do a QA and a at the end of Jennifer's presentation. So if you have any questions, um, please leave them in the chat that you see located at the bottom of your screen. Jennifer Mack Watkins is a contemporary visual artist whose primary studio practice entails silkscreen, Japanese woodblock, and other forms of printmaking techniques. Her work investigates the societal constructs that leave women feeling isolated, and she explores definitions of femininity based on widely held notions of beauty and cultural norms. Her artistic aesthetic draws from a confluence of reference points most of which include her Mokahanga printmaking techniques and her culturally rich Southern roots. In 2015, Jennifer was selected to participate in the Mokahanga Innovative Innovation Laboratory Artist in Residence Program in Yamanashi, Japan, and was a Joan Mitchell Foundation 2015 Emerging Artist nominee. In the summer of 2021, Jennifer's work was featured in the New York Times, Vogue, Art, and Object, Pressing Matters and Essence. She's also the recipient of the Elizabeth Catlett Printmaking Award presented by Hamptons University Museum. In You Gotta Meet Mr. Pierce, her first illustrated book published by, um, excuse me, Coquilla Random House, she created illustrations using Mokahanga printmaking technique in addition to mixed media collage. While illustrating this book, she combines personal memories of growing up in her mother's salon, along with film, photographs, and archival research on Elijah Pierce's life um, to imagine his shop. Institutional acquisitions include the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Thomas J. Watson Library, Library of Congress, Hood Museum of Art, Zimmerly Museum, Agnes Scott Cow College, the Getty Library, Newark Public Library, and Clark Atlanta University. Her work is also held in the permanent collections of ABC Studios and many other private collections. Jennifer has presented her work in the Rush Arts Gallery 20th Anniversary Exhibition and Print Portfolio that was exhibited in New York City and at, the Muse um, at Miami Scope and Prism Art Fairs. Jennifer is a native of Charleston, South Carolina, and currently lives and works in both New Jersey and Georgia. Jennifer holds a BA in Studio Arts from Morris Brown College, an MF M MAT from Tufts University, and an MFA in Printmaking from Pratt Institute. Jennifer is currently exhibiting at the Zimmerman Lee Museum on the campus of Rutgers University, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Um, she also has an upcoming exhibit at Sulphur Studios in Savannah, Georgia. Um, and we'll be putting links in the chat later so you can um, check these out. Um, and now I will hand things over to Jennifer. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm really excited that MGC is, uh, has asked me to come and share with you some of my work as a printmaker. I'm happy to see some faces that I know. I see April and Dawn and um, some of the new faces. And I'm really excited to share with you more about my practice as a printmaker. So I'm going to share my screen. And okay. And so um, I wanted to start off with um, my favorite set of tools. Um, these tools are really dear to me. Um, I traveled um, to Japan twice and I've been able to 
find uh, really great tools because you can go to Japan and just go and find the actual source of where they come to before they come to the States. So I can actually find and get the tools myself. And so these are some of my favorite tools that I've gathered um, from Japan. But then I also want to try to go right into like showing how I'm also interested in Makohanga. And I've been doing this since about 2012 with my with my instructor who is here, April Vomer, um, who is here. And so she taught me um, Makohanga. But then from there, I was able to take my um, my style and um, my, my techniques that I have learned along the way of my study and apply it to other um, forms of printmaking, which include the color lithographs, rizzle graphs, and silk screens. And so I really like going back and forth between printmaking mediums. I don't want to be confined to like only doing one technique because I like to be able to choose based on what I'm trying to say, what I'm trying to share, um, the space that I, you know, sometimes I work on book projects. So sometimes I have to be able to think, okay, well, how can I translate, you know, my prints into risograph? Well, a way that I did that, um, as you can see in this slide, I did a uh, um, a collage first. And then from there, I was able to translate that to risograph. And the risograph is kind of like the bluish um, and purplish kind of color on the bottom right. And so I translated it from collage into risograph by doing a book project that I did with um, some artists in Newark. Um, then you see the star like with the boy silhouette, that's Black Boy Hope. Um, series. I have Black Boy Hope 1 and 2, and that's a color lithograph. And so I really was really trying to figure out how to like take, you know, two and trying to make it kind of react naturally by just putting on, you know, some alcohol and, and letting the two and kind of develop to make this marbleized kind of um, kind of like experimentation. And I did that published with uh, with Jungle Press Editions. And then um, I, I have these dolls, which I'm going to be displaying, which is part of the, the exhibition called Children of the Sun. And um, these are all silk screenings, but I like to combine like hand drawn and technology um, with flat colors and um, some references of space in the background. So I just wanted to kind of give you like a a sense of like, you know, the, the variety of different techniques I love to go go in and out of depending on what I'm trying to express. Um, but then I want to come, I want to come here. So I feel like um, these are, these are like, this is the book and this is like Hokusai, not just any book, <laughs> um, Hokusai's drawings um, from 1818. And um, it's a Met's collection. So I wanted to really talk about this, how I kind of got to like illustration and how, how I got to even be interested in, in Japanese prints. And so for me, it's more than just a place, it's more than just a technique and the fact that it's, it's an old technique that is still practiced today um, internationally. Um, and so for me, I'm really interested in the stories that Japanese prints tell. Um, not only when you look at prints of Japanese prints, um, I feel like you can hear, you can see, you can taste, you can smell. It's very, it has all the five senses involved when you're looking at the prints. And so I like to try to incorporate that intimate work and making sure that there's a sense of like, you know, emotion and there's a sense of place. And so I, I try to put that in my own work. And so I'm very much influenced by just aesthetically how it makes me feel as an artist. And um, also being the fact that, you know, there's texture and there's mark making. And that's the same thing in any printmaking, but Japanese printmaking is very, very detailed and is very, it allows you to very really be able to like focus in and what's going on in the in the in the narrative and think about what in time and place and why this print was created. And so um I want to go ahead and show you some of the some of the tools that is used to make mokohanga. And so um in my case I like to use between um gouache and watercolor and um then you have your brushes that you use to apply to the to the surface that is wet. And then you also have your, your Kinta registration, which helps you to make sure that the paper is put in place every time, the same place every time to make sure that your colors are lined up. And um, then I also want to think about, okay, well, how did I learn this? And so <laughs> I found a bunch of pictures um, from time, a lot of times um, that I think I even found my first print that I ever made was called Sweep This. I made in 2012 in April's class. And I took April Vomer's class at Lower East Side Print Shop six times. Each class was six weeks. Each class happened after work between six and nine on Thursdays, every Thursday. Um, and so um, I started there and I kept taking the classes. I took classes from Takuji Hamanaka at, um, at, another, at another print shop not too far from there. And um, and so basically that print shop is where you where I am talking now in Manhattan graphics. And I took that class there um, with Takuji um two times. And um the most recent was 2019. But let's back up 
that's so, so 2012 was the first print ever made. And then I got a chance to um, apply to go to, um, even before I applied, like, right, I went to the conference, like I took the class from April Bomber and she was like, yeah, I'm going to a conference in Japan. And we we're like, it's, you know, there's no way in the world, you know, we're going to be able to go to Japan. And then I was like, well, well, let me just try. And so I decided to do a, 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 a GoFundMe kind of uh, Indiegogo and I raised money to be able to go to Japan. And um, I flew out there. I got a chance to present a paper presentation and I got a chance to meet like the whole international you know, artists of all, all over the world that really embraced Mokohanga. And I never had been to a conference that really embraced it from a scholarly perspective. So I, I love the fact that when we when we come together every three years, different locations, um, we're able to share paper presentations and techniques and, and materials and ex exhibitions. And so it's a very one of a kind, um, you know, community to be a part of. And then um, that was 2014. And in 2015, I applied to um, be a part of um, the Me Lab Innovation Laboratory, which was founded by Keiko Kododa, which you could see um, in the top. Um, Keiko passed away a few years ago. She's definitely, you know, very, very much missed. And uh, she's the reason why I'm here today. You know, I remember before she had passed away and she was like, you know, you have to make sure you spread, you know, your love for Makahanga. You know, it shares, it helps people to, you know, share things together and it makes peace and and um, I kept saying, you gonna, I'm going to see you, you know, when you come to the Hawaii, because it's it all thinking about all these things are going to happen in the future. But because of her vision, she's able to bring artists from all over the, the world to come and embrace and learn and share Makohanga, and, which is all of our passions. And um, these are some quick pictures. And I have April Bomber, the most recent at the, um, at the Javits Center, the IFPDA um, conference. And that was most recent. And... And so here are some of the prints that I made um, when I was there. I really was really looking at a lot of nature. And I never walked that much before in my life. I, you know, I drive everywhere. But at that time, I was living in um, I was living in Hoboken. So like just to see so much, you know, outdoors. And we were in Yamanashi. So you know, you look out and on a non-rainy day, non-foggy day, because we were there in July. You could see Mount Fuji in the background. So I was really, really, I was really like really, um, really amazed at how beautiful it was. And so I wanted to capture like, you know, that in my own prints. And this first time I ever, you know, put nature into my prints. And so I made um, a series of prints called The Conqueror that really um, showed myself as a as a Black samurai and um, the burning village to showcase, the, you know, the burning of the community and how I am to save it, you know, through my art and through my passion as an artist. And um, then I started to like, you know, light years later, that was 2015, 2019. I was like, you know what? Like I, I did so many prints about like, you know, the black woman in, um, you know, in the kitchen and making the home her space and providing for her family with food. But you know what? The woman can also, you know, she could be in space, you know, and she has been in space and she has can she will continue to be in space. And so I wanted to think about how I could inspire my own daughter to say, okay, look, you see mommy in the kitchen, but you also can do more than just being in the kitchen cooking. You can, you can go, you can be an astronaut. And and even till this day. She's six years old. She's like, mommy, I'm going to work for NASA. I'm going to go to space. I'm going to be the first, you know, um, you know, woman to bring animals and plants into space. And so at six years old, she already knows what she wants to do. She has a great imagination. So I wanted to continue to make prints that will inspire her and also my son. So I said, well, let me think about, you know, a female and that would be Dr. Mae Jamison. So I started to making these, these prints that have like star-like imagery in it. This is a combination of collage slash mokohunga. And um, it's called Take a Look on the University of Yours. And I got the title from uh, the 1980-ish uh, um, TV show called uh, Reading Rainbow, which everyone should know, LeVar Burton. And I think even the lyrics, I took that, the title from the lyric and I made it part of this, um, this Makahunga mixed media print. And so I continued to kind of stay in space after that. And then um, for the exhibition that I had um, back um, March 2021 at the Brattleboro Museum in Vermont, I decided to go back in history. So I kind of go back and forth between past and, and present and future in my work. And so I looked at the um, the book that was edited by W. Du Bois uh, called The Brownies Book. It was a short run monthly magazine that was for, um, for children. And in that book, it had um, like puzzles and like photographs that people would send in of their children, um, particularly, you know, all Black children, to kind of like really help them to see happiness. Because at a time there was still, um, there was there there still be continued to be like you know a lot of unrest and uh, not an equal treatment of African Americans and also um, murders and killings of African Americans. But he wanted to have a space that can also educate them about social social things that were happening in the world, but also 
provide a place for them to be able to take their imagination, to be happy, to be free, and to celebrate them um, as children. And so that was a called the Brownies book. And so I looked at that. At that time, I was looking for a way to connect with Daisy Turner, who was a local oralist of that area. She was from Grafton, uh, Vermont. I got a chance to visit this place for real. And it was amazing because they were able to save her homestead that her, that her dad made. And so um, I wanted to make sure that I had a connection to Black history. So I looked up, you know, Black history of Vermont. And then Daisy Turner's name kept coming up. I said, wow, she must have been very important. So I decided to go and research more about her life. And then I found out um, that I was really, really interested in like, okay, well, what, what was it to be a child, you know, in 1890s? What would it be like to be a child in 1920s? And think about all the different ways of what is it, what does it mean? And how does that, that dynamic change from year to year and what our country and the world has been going through? And so in this book, you know, I, I really looked at, okay, well, you know, how are children, how are children like, you know, represented, you know, and then this book, families would send off their best photographs of their children dressed up. And I wanted that to be the same way. Like, okay, I want dolls to be dressed up in a museum, but um, not just any dolls, but the doll story goes back to Daisy Turner because she was able to, um, you know, think about what, what things that she thought was unequally fair during that time. Um, and then also I, I kind of went back and forth between the history of Daisy Turner and her connection to being a child. And then I also talked about, you know, with, I also looked at um, work, the work that was in the Brownies book. So I'm showing you some images of what you might've seen in the issue in 1920. And so here are the dolls. And so the dolls come into play because I started to think about um, the story that Daisy Turner told. And there's an oral story that you can find online of her telling the story about a doll that was given to her. And the doll, the teacher wanted her to say a poem. Daisy wanted to do something different. And she gave it a resilient poem that she um, recited. And she, she recited till she was almost 100 years old. And so I wanted to take that dolly and uh, that doll and give it a resilient, like, look, I'm here. You know, I'm in this space. And um, in, in the space around it, the stars represent the future, but it's also representing the past. And so, um, so you can see in this exhibition um, that I had and that I will be showing again in Savannah, it's a series of a number of dolls and the dolls are all differently dressed in different um, time period clothes. And I also did a collage piece that had, I cut out the dolls and put um, you know, two dolls in space. I said, why can't dolls you know, be in space and combine the past and present together? And um, this is what the exhibition looked like. And I had a picture of, of Daisy Turner right when you walked into the exhibition. So, and that's what I created with that exhibition. And I said, I want this to be documented. So how can I make sure that people can't get to Vermont? Because Vermont definitely isn't easy to get to. So I said, let me think about, um, let me think about how, how I can make this accessible. So I, I self-published my own book and I found a design, design, designer based in Texas. And then I got some books printed and then I sold it in the gift shop and then they sold out and then they bought more for me and I printed more. So it was a good, a good way to be able to make sure my prints were accessible for people who couldn't get there. And, um, and then uh, my books um, sold. And then I said, well, what about trying to think about how can I showcase my work as an artist and how can I, you know, not only see myself as using my art as like a way to like preserve, you know, my legacy a book is a way, but also being able to wait to get my work into like something like the Library of Congress. So this this is something that can be pulled and it could be um, looked upon even when I'm not here on this earth, but my children can go there and, and see, you know, my work in the Library of Congress. So they have about three prints there and um, currently that can be seen by anyone. Um, and then also I thought about, okay, well, it's important to be able to work collectively. So I was uh, a member, a founding member of the Black Women of Print. And during that time, um, we made a, a collaborative portfolio in that collaborative portfolio ended up getting into the Metropolitan Museum. And during that time, we were given each uh, a Black woman printmaker to be inspired by. I chose Betty Saar. I really was inspired by her sense of um, being able to take mixed media and combine it with imagery and also, you know, her way to understand the importance of, you know, seeing the future, but also seeing herself as a, as a female and as a mother and as an artist. And um, I wanted that to kind of go in with the work that I made and I titled it Future Undetermined. Future Undetermined because at that time I was pregnant with my son and um, it was a lot of unrest in 2019 and a lot was happening and it still continues to happen today. But I wanted to find a way to be able to, you know, mark this time, you know, and what, how I was feeling at the time. And so I made a, um, something that reminded me of, you know, babies like 
falling and I feel like okay how can we catch and save the babies and I added in some um some you know some some latin and some some dictionary def definitions of um dignity which you can see in the background in some target to show that you know children and specifically black children are targets and so I wanted to also say okay this is my reference to you know the social problem what's happening here um every day you know and so and also I have some math equations so I think the most important thing is to have education to be able to educate yourself and this is a way to determine your future and how you can you know navigate the world and so that's why I made this print called Future Undetermined and um, I decided to make take the Makuhanga that's what take Makuhanga technique and then combine that to make that the key block and then that became the silk screen so I combined silk screening and um, Makuhanga together to make the print that is at the Met. Um, and then from there, you can see um, installation shots of the Museum of Fine Arts. They also have one of the prints there too. They have the whole collection. And then the Metropolitan, Metropolitan, Metropolitan Museum of Art. And so the thing with the portfolio that all the works that are on display, if they were to be displayed, they were displayed all together, not separate. And that's what makes it a powerful way to be able to work together collectively. Um, these are the two prints that I made with Jungle Press. And so I, I think collective collective work is really important and I continuously do it over and over in my work it's the only way to be able to you know be able to get yourself out there and also to be able to use each other's resources and and strengths and so um this is a color lithograph that is black boy hope one and two and um and you can see that I'm really interested in okay look the experimentation and then like the drawings I had fun experimenting and also I had fun to to, to draw and define what I thought black boy hope would look like to me and um, I, we published another one again, um, Jungle Press Editions, Andrew Mockler is awesome. Um, this is Space Boy, um, Space Boy and Space Girl. And I thought like I wanted to make sure that my son and daughter knew that, you know, you both can go to space together, you know, in your mind or, or for real. And um, I also wanted to think about like, and I made the Space Girl, um, I made sure that she would bring something from the earth to be able to replant and um and to to grow you know we can't continue just to take from the earth and not to replant so I wanted to try to add in uh, environmental um perspective as well and now let's uh, go a little bit further into um you know how where is this all going so then I think I really got into like getting into telling stories and so space boy space boy girl space boy and space girl was a way for me to really think sequentially of how I can use my fine art um passion and interest and then now I'm taking that and making that into a book um so this is a book that I made with Michael Hunga this is Elijah Pierce uh, he's a woodcarver he was born in Mississippi migrated to Ohio uh, I think he was, was born in 1892 and died, died in 1984 so he lived to be about 92 and um so when Cole Kila found me they are like okay we need we needed someone to you know that was a woodcarver and that was me and um and so I decided to do the whole book in Makuhanga, and I was like, what did I get myself into? Um, and so, thirty four blocks later, I made a book. Um, but a lot of the book was made pretty much in my home studio because it was during COVID, you know. Um, and it took about a year and a half to create, and then I finished up the last panels, carving them at least um, at Penland. I had a residency there last year. I finished those up, and I got home, and I added the other color components and collage, but. I think it's important to be able to make your practice in different spaces. And that was the first time I was able to take, I pretty much had shipped like four boxes there. I, I had too many things, but I had all the what I needed, you know, but I think it's important to be able to, you know, have all your tools you need or just what you need, not don't pack too much like I did, but um, it's important to be able to take your studio and your studio can be anywhere. And that's the beauty of like, you know, printmaking, that's the beauty of Makohanga because you don't need, you know, too many tools to, uh, to be able to create. And um, I think residencies give me a, a sense of, of, of place that I can be able to like make my work and not have to worry about who has snacks or like is dinner made. Like I ate, you know, I don't know what I ate, but I had to really worry about myself on my residency. When I'm home, I'm trying to juggle between, you know, taking care of the children, my husband, my family and making art. And when I was away for two weeks, Penland allowed me to be able to finish up my last um, panels for the, for the book. And so this is what the book looks like. And so this is called, You Gotta Meet Mr. Pierce. And it's written by uh, Chiquita, Chiquita Mullinsley and Kamala Van Leet. And I illustrated this. And this is my first illustrated book. Um, and this 
page, I show you uh, my daughter. My daughter is in it because I was making the book and she would come in when I'm, when I'm carving, trying to finish this book. I have, I have deadlines. My first time ever having deadlines. I'm like, wait, in art, you know, you can take as long as you want. But in the publishing world, it doesn't work like that. You have deadlines. And when you have deadlines, you have people reviewing your things. They can make edits and say, change this, change that. And so the whole process for me was like, whoa, this is a whole nother process. And so as I'm making the book, my daughter's like, well, where am I? And mind you, it's a barbershop. And I grew up in a salon and my mom had a barbershop built on the back for my brother because he was a barber. I'd never really go on the backside because, you know, you don't, you know, you don't want to, it's a, a bunch of men just sitting in there. And so you would, you would stay on the salon side. My mom, you know, I'd go there to tell him, my brother, yo, you know, you have a phone call and I go back on the other side or I give him some towels or something like that. But I was like, you know, you're right. You're asking me, where are you? And I was like, well, what? well, this is, this is modern day times. So why can't you be on the barbershop side? So I made my daughter in the book as a twin. I have one, but her personality is like, is like a twin. So I put two of her in this book and, um, and she's in there. And then, um, I also have some interpretation of what Elijah Pierce's work would look like. And also you can see some texture of the chair because, you know, it's leather. So I really wanted to kind of capture what the black barbershop will look like. Um, sorry, just stopping. Okay. And here are some sketches. It, it would have looked like before. So I'm making sure that every little square that I that I drew, every little picture fit inside, and which was not was not Photoshop shrunken. Like I made tiny, tiny, tiny little um, you know drawings and placed them inside the frame, and when I carved them, and then I um, pan painted and drew my daughter, and then that became digitally placed into the to the book. So this could all be seen if you're in the area of um, New Brunswick on the campus of Rutgers. Uh, the Zimli Museum, the whole the whole entire book, you know, is there. The original art, everything that I'm showing you, this, I have a few sketches there. I have um, all the original art, all 34 um, original art is on display at Rutgers until July 30th. And um, here's an example of what the installation looks like. And it's just a beautiful exhibition that I haven't seen yet. Um, I'll be going, coming up there next week. So if you're in, if you're in town, I'll be um, talking at an art talk with um, Jeffrey Wolf, who's a filmmaker who, who gave me a lot of artifacts and a lot of um, videos and film to inspire my book. So we'll be having a conversation next week um, at, and I think I think Kay and Jim, MGC will be putting that in the link about that, um, that event. And so in this exhibition, you'll see my sketches and some of the wood blocks, and you'll also see some of Elijah Pierce's work. So that line right there, that's Elijah Pierce's work. And also there's some photographs of him as well. And here is another, installation shot I wanted to make sure everyone knew that this is this is Mr. Pierce who you have to meet and so I think wherever I do an exhibition that is inspired by someone historically I always want to make sure that's my trademark of having a photograph of seeing the artist you know at work or, or that person who I'm inspired by because I think when I went to MoMA and I always go to MoMA you see big old stretches of like you know people of artists in their spaces and I wanted to have that same feel when I when I um, helped to curate this show as well. Um, and then like here, fast forwarding more, it's like so much to share, right? So like now, like I'm going from pre-maker to like, you know, I'm publishing, I'm doing um, collaboration with other artists. And this is like my first book tour. So I'm like, yes, this is, this is amazing. People come and I'm signing books and people are buying 10 books. And my friends from Atlanta are coming representing with their own children. And I'm seeing my, my professor, um, you can see him on the far right, Mr. Hickey with the gray sweater and Tina Dunkley. Those two are really important because when I was taking classes at Morris Brown in the AUC, which is Atlanta University Center, I went to historically black college university. Um, Mr. Hickey was my first printmaking teacher that I ever had and only because it's so small that, you know, that one teacher teaches like all the sections and it wasn't like it was thriving with people in it. So I took every section that they had, even if it was just me, I got to a point where they had independent studies and I was the only person independently studying, but I didn't care because I had one-on-one -on -one instruction. So I learned a lot of techniques um, from him as far as carving. And um, he introduced me to some um, black printmakers that still inspire me today. And then I got a chance to um, also, um, you know, do some virtual uh, virtual talks. And you can see Chiquita and Carmela in Ohio. That was in Ohio. I wasn't even there, but we did a virtual talk. Um, the library had a big screen. So it's, it was like I was there. So I've been able to, you know, present my information virtually in person book signings. Um, just recently, I did a um, demonstration printmaking, printmaking um, demonstration at a bookstore in Savannah. So I've been able to vary my different ways of how I share my information. And I find that even though I've, you know, I've shown my work in like, you know, places like the Met and like the Boston, you know, the museum in Boston and like 
in galleries and different spaces, but there's nothing like being able to interact with the community and be able to share, you know, your passion for printmaking and being able to see the reaction, you know, right away. And I feel like when I, when I see these pictures like this and like having all these children around me, like I did two hours and I saw like 200 kids, like it's like even the average, you know, art show, you know, you might see 50, 40 people, but it's at one time. So like the book, the book thing, the book publishing world, when you're signing books and you're illustrating, it's like impactful because you get those numbers right away. And I did, this was like, I might've been like, are they first grade? That might be like first grade, but it was a lot of kids. And um, I really enjoyed being able to sh show them the wood block. They touched it. They, 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 they wanted the books, but I didn't have enough to give up everybody, but it was just a great experience. And I feel like uh, this is just like kind of where I wanted to be. And the school was very important because this is where I started teaching. So when I was, I was an art teacher, K through 12 for about 15 years. And this is the very first teaching job I had in Atlanta at Charles R. Drew Charter School. So it was very um, memorable for me to be able to go back to a school where I started. And um, today I wanted to show you my, uh, my posters for my upcoming exhibition, Children of the Sun in Orbit, as a continuation of the exhibition I showed in Vermont with a few new pieces. And um, I'm showing that at Sulphur Studio. It's upcoming on Friday. And I'm going to have an artist talk May 27th. Um, I'm going to have um, a book reading for the kids. I have to always include the kids. I think it's important for them to be able to interact with, with fine art. And also, um, you know, I can read a book to them. I can sign the books. And the the um, the Sulphur Studio, the gallery, is also going to be selling. They're selling the book as well. So they have the chance to be able to see the work and to be able to take the work home with them in a book form or maybe they want to purchase, I'm not sure. Um, but then I also wanted to show that I'm adding a component to it that I didn't have in Vermont. So um, I taught filmmaking for about five years at this private school before I moved down to Savannah. So I said, why not make my own film? So I um, used some stock videos and I found the perfect videos of, of African-American female in space. I put that in sequential order and premiere. And um, I worked with uh, Will Penny, who was a many contemporary artist, and he's also a SCAD uh, faculty. And we put two projectors together to make it seamlessly fit together to take up the whole wall space. And so um, I used the, the song Lift Me Up by Rihanna, look it up. Um, and I put that as the background soundtrack with some stars and moons and some other little surprises. So if you're in the area of Savannah, um, check it out. This, this is an addition that I added to the dolls as well. I'm also going to be trying something different. I'm going to be doing open studios. I never really um, open my studio up to like public, like, you know, like as a public event. So I'm going to have open studios where people can come and I'll do a short talk for them around the exhibition and then my studio is upstairs. So it's perfect that they, you know, the gallery is downstairs and my studio is upstairs. So I'm doing about four sessions of those on Sundays. And then this is my information. If you want to find out more about my event, upcoming events, um, contact me for any bookings, um, any purchases, all that can be done through the website. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to put in the chat. I'm looking forward to hearing from you with the Q&A and take it from here. I think either Kay or Robin, I'm not sure. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer, um, for sharing your work with us. Um, it was really wonderful to see what you've been working on and um, to learn about your process and also just more, more about the context to the work. Um, and also it was great to hear about uh, your, your book, you, you Gotta Meet Mr. Pierce. I love that photo um, of all those those little kids sitting around um, with the book. Um, anyway, your work's really beautiful. Um, so we, we can start taking questions. Uh, so if you have any, um, please put them in the chat. Um, or um, if you prefer- turn um, off the, Can I turn on my mic? Yeah, yeah. We, we, um, I was gonna say, um, if you prefer, you can, uh, we can try to have a conversation. We could sort of do like a hybrid. If anybody has any questions, put it in the chat. But yeah, if you want to ask a question, uh, you can you can unmute and uh, go for I, it. I was wondering, you, you said you're going to be in New Jersey at Rutgers next week. W what's that event? Um, so basically, I'm going to um, be there talking about my process of putting the, together the book. And then my research that I used um, to create the book with Jeffrey Wolf, who is a, who is a um, filmmaker. And so he'll be there. We'll be in conversation. And because he knew Jeffrey, sorry, Jeffrey knew Elijah Pierce because he did the film about him and he took tons of photographs. He has some of his own work from him and he developed a relationship with Elijah before he passed away. So that's the connection oh. between Elijah Pierce and the so book. He helped you with the book. And now you're having a, a joint exhibition there. 
Yeah, it's like it's a joint. Most everything there is is mine, except for like three um, works by Elijah, and then I think um, Jeffrey let us loan loan us the three. He had three works by Elijah, and then he had four photographs of Elijah. He took of Elijah, so it was oh. like a combination, you know, together. But and he helped you with the the film, the background for. I didn't do the film. He made the film in 1974. I wasn't even born, but I found. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I found the footage when I was researching Elijah Pierce because I didn't I didn't know who he was. I had no idea. I was like, who? I was like, are you sure? Well, we need to do this? A lot more people know now that you've published this book. <laughs> I know. And like, I didn't now now they're ahead of the game because in the beginning I didn't know who he was, but because of his film he made in 1974 and the photographs and things he he documented like a humongous archive of like his notes and his receipts when he sold things and like letters like he's able to to art he, he's able to, to to um to hold all that and so with all the information he's able to share with me it helped me to really make it really personal and really make it people understand about who Elijah Pierce was as a barber as an entrepreneur and as a self-taught artist so it should be a lot of fun to um to talk to him within within per- I never met him before because I, I talked to him I, I've researched him like I researched you okay and, um, <laughs> oh, so the research was all um online online because I was doing COVID and I, yeah, and I, yeah. I, email, I emailed him Great and have something a project <laughs> during COVID very COVID and um so I, I emailed him he responded back and then that's how we started talking on zoom and through the phone so that's kind of that's how the book came to, came into play that's amazing <laughs> that's great um so uh we have some questions in, in chat that I want to get to um one is from Ruth Moscovich and she's saying I'm not familiar with the term Mokahanga can you explain yeah, so makahanga, you know, you have wood in, in block, right? And so basically you're printing with wood and it's a block form. And then you have paper that is is usually it could be wet or dry. And you're using um, anything from sumi ink, rice paste, gouache, dry pigments. I could, you can make your own pigments. Um, you know, you can do pigment dispersions. You can do um, watercolor, you know, at the tube. There's different ways how you can do it, but now these days, internationally, people have been able to use different types of techniques. There are artists today who use um, oil-based ink, and they might carve, you know, Makonga way, but they might print it, you know, with them with a press, or some people might might use a 3D printer, you know. And so I feel like it's important to know, you know, that Makonga has, has definitely advanced, but then you can also do it traditionally as well with those materials. The 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 word itself is a Japanese word. Oh, yeah. Definitely, definitely Japanese word, makuhanga. Yes, but but it means woodcut in Japanese. Woodcut, yes. Okay. Um, so, so now, um, can I just follow oh. up? Um, so I I took uh, Takuji's um, Japanese woodcut class at Manhattan Graphics. So is that the same thing that you're talking about, or is or is are we talking about a different technique? And I'm just not seeing what's different. That's what you took. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, I took I took it from Takuji and I took it from April as well. Right. And and April has taught for us as well at Manhattan Graphics. Yeah. Yeah. And it's it's getting better known this this technique because of those little classes and because of the programs Jennifer was involved with in Japan. So mm-hmm. it's better known now than it used to be. Great. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, let's see. So we have a question from Fred Mershima. Um, what was the process? Uh, what was the process of starting your print group? Did you ask friends you knew, or did you post a, ch- a call for other printmakers who were black women? Well, it started off with um, with uh, with Tanikia Word, and so she found us. So I feel like on social media, you know, it's important to be able to promote who you are as an artist. And then from there, the community becomes, you know, even more expansive because you have the social media to be able to be to advertise yourself. And then you start to follow people who are, you know, doing things that you're interested in or you find a connection to. And so I was invited by um, by Tanika Ward and it it was her vision to be able to start this group to support black women printmakers. Okay, and then. um... We have a comment and question from Maggie Black. She's saying, wonderful to see your work. Thank you. At which Rutgers campus is the show? But actually, I can answer that because I know it's it's uh, the Zimmerle Museums uh, in uh, New Brunswick, New Jersey. So, um, yeah. Um, so um, does anybody else want to ask Jennifer a question? Um, if you don't want to type in in chat, you can unmute yourself and ask out loud. Um, it's, up, it's up to you. Um, so any other questions? 
<laughs> Good, Ruth. Ruth, um, Ruth so, has so I, I loved your children's books, and I just think they would be such wonderful presents for my grandchildren. So, are they for sale somewhere? Yes, they are sale. They are for sale. Okay, you can put it in the chat. There's a few ways. Um, you can just type up. You got to meet Mr. Pierce, but. Kay will put in um, a few links and you could uh, purchase there. They make great presents. Um, thanks for the advertisement, Ruth. Um, you can buy it in ones or fives, tens, twenties, <laughs> um, however you wish that you want to buy. But um, they are available for purchase. And if you come to um, if you come to the, the talk next week, I believe they're going to be selling it there as well. I am also working with um, Source of Knowledge is a bookstore in Newark. They're going to be having some um, for sale if you want to get it in person, but you can also get it shipped to you. That's also easier. But I think they put that in the chat. Okay, but, great. Yeah, I put the link for the book. I'm just going to put it again so it's refreshed at the bottom of the chat, but there's also links to both exhibitions and the event if you scroll up as well. Thank you, Kay. Thank you. Um, nice to see so people. So actually, I, I have a, a question about you your book. Um, what, what, like, what age group is it for? Is it... Um, yeah, like ages four to eight, but you, surprising when I have the book signing, most people who come are <laughs> are adults. Um, and and well, so, I, I mean, I, I love children's books, so they're, you know, it's not such a like, you know, yeah, but <laughs> it's for it's four to eight, but um, it, it definitely has some um, some history of, of like that is inspired by um, Elijah Pierce, and so I think it's really important to be able to kind of fuse mm -hmm. together art and like literacy and like um, in history. So I think it's a really great book for all ages, but specifically sure. for eight. Well, yeah, I guess I was asking because uh, one of my little nieces is eight, so I th think this would be a perfect book for her. Oh, so. She would love. She would love it. I hope. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. the illustrations are so so great, and yeah, I think as you're saying, it, it's a good thing for kids to learn about. Um, so. Um, anyway, uh, any other questions for Jennifer? You can add them to the chat. Um, oh, here's something that just popped up. Um, uh, it's from Janice Paris. Um, have you held virtual events or plan to do so in the future? Um, I, I, as far as like like virtual book talks or virtual art talks. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe maybe Jennifer, uh, maybe Janice, uh, you can be a little more specific or. Um, you may, maybe you want to unmute yourself so you can um, sort of explain you know, exactly what you were referring to. Hi. Yes. Um, virtual book talks, art, art talks, is anything that would um, exhibit your work that way virtually? Um, I think I think as far as like virtual talks, I did a few of those earlier um, in the year, but I can still continue to do those more. Uh, as far as like events. I think I'm going to be doing like something for Rutgers, but for teachers. So it kind of comes to depending on like the library or institution. But as far as like holding hosting my own, I haven't done that yet. Um, that takes a lot of um, courage just to host. Hey, I'm having a virtual event. But I usually just kind of work with partnership with institutions to do those type of events. But in the future, for sure. And I'm open to it as well. Okay, that's, that's interesting. Uh, sorry, I also have another question. Um, what was your favorite space you worked in? That's a hard question. I worked a lot of different places. Um, it probably have to be when I went to the Me Lab in Me Lab inventory um, in um, in Japan. So I think it would probably be in Japan um, because I think there was no distractions and I had only what I needed. Um, mm -hmm. I didn't have access of anything. It only came with whatever I had. I got a chance to meet other people from all over the world. And I just think being able to have access to be able to work with people for like a month um, mm -hmm. and you kind of become like family. You cook together, you, you eat together, you cry together when you miss your family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I feel like traveling internationally, I think was probably my best place that I like to um, be able to study and make work. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. hey, um, any Anybody else have a question you'd like to ask Jennifer? Anything else you can unmute or put it in the chat? Um, I guess, I guess so we're done with I, the I just have, so oh. have you left the New York, New Jersey area now and you're living in South Carolina? Is that what I understand? Oh, no, I'm from South Carolina. I definitely <laughs> don't live there. I live in Savannah, um, but I go visit. Um, but as far as like uh, traveling, I just travel wherever. So like I'm coming to Jersey and then my publisher is in New York, you know, so I feel like I 
kind of go back and forth between those places because a lot of the places happen, you know, in the north, um, a few in the south. But you know, I feel like I kind of travel back and forth. I don't mind going back and forth between Savannah or wherever I need to go to promote my book, promote my art, from my passion for printmaking. So I I like kind of like being like a kind of like a nomad you know, artists, but eventually I would like to have my own space where I can have artists like you and people on this call to be able to come together and make work where they might not live. And so I wanted to create that space in the future for other artists to have a place to be able to, to do that with just their suitcase and a few tools and I have everything you need. And then um, you just come print with me and you go home and I ship it to you. So that's kind of like a business plan I want to have in the future because I feel like, you know, you want to go to nice places. Savannah is beautiful and, you know, there's beaches here um the trees are beautiful um it's peaceful you know and I feel like I definitely have a peace of mind living here but I also want to be able to bring y'all from the city to get away from the city come here and make art and um I want to be able to make that space so I don't have to feel like a nomad a space that's my own a space where people can come together and learn and create and discuss and share so that's kind of like a dream of mine that sounds great <laughs> yeah thank you will that be in Savannah then It'll be in Savannah. And then as I move around more places, I'll make more places, you know, around the states. Cause I think printmaking could be in every state. Um and <laughs> <laughs> in every country, every continent. So maybe that's just be this would be this would be the incubator space. You know, I have more and have managers looking for man. If you want to be a manager, let me know. Send me an email and, and you can do that location wherever I choose to be. I just have one question. Okay. Where do you get your energy? You've been doing so much. I'm so impressed. Where are you getting energy from? My children. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, really they, great great they, to hear what you've been up to. <laughs> thank you. They, de they deplete my energy and they also refuel my energy because I, <laughs> I do it. I do it for them. I do it because I want them to see, want them to see that their mother can, can be more than I can be more than a mother. I can be more than just, you know, a nine to five. I can, I can be an artist. I can, I can inspire others. I can share, I can create. And um, I feel like I want to be able to have that same work ethic in their own selves. I feel like I have to be a model to them. So that's how they refuel me. I'm tired. You know, I definitely get tired, but I feel like they help me to remind me why I'm here as an artist and my purpose. And this is them and, and they're all the children. You're inspiring me. <laughs> thank you you inspire me <laughs> well, that, that's really wonderful um so um so does anybody else um have a question or, or comment um we do have a comment from Cynthia driver she says thank you um so thank you <laughs> um i have a question i may i may have understood it wrong this is ann um i thought you said something about you did a cooperative printmaking experience but maybe I understood that wrong how did that work if I got that right okay well I did a collective um portfolio like kind of yeah. kind of how when you were in, when you were in school when you study printmaking it's pretty common for you to make a portfolio right and so there was a theme you know and then we had a theme and then we had to select the artist and then um you know figure out why that artist was important study it and then we take our own make our own print and then we made a print Put it together and then um then from there we kind of just saw who was interested in, in their, their interest and only made a, a small amount and then um that's how we collectively made the made the box we never even saw each other's print until we got it you know ah. later on we didn't you know we didn't you know we didn't we didn't have sessions and say share things and like it kind of just collectively flowed because the theme we all connected to a connected theme Mm -hmm. kind, of how you would, kind of how you would do like you in grad school you know I, I had a lot of print exchanges and that's pretty much what it was but just on a level where it doesn't just sit in your box because you got it from class but now it's on display for people to see and have access to it even after it comes down mm -hmm. and making a legacy you know that can continue on to be passed and looked upon for years on okay Any, anyone else don't be shy <laughs> um you have a question um you can just unmute and ask it or put it in the chat um so i guess no more questions okay well in that case um i have to thank you so much jennifer um this was really a great talk um it's really inspiring um i also want to um say thanks to everyone who joined us this evening um just as a reminder uh please visit our website at manhattangraphiccenter.org you'll also be able to sign up for future talks and see our other events and classes and join our mailing list um also 
uh, please follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook to keep up to date. And one last thing, if you're in our neighborhood, we currently have a beautiful exhibit in our gallery, Jean Betancourt Epiphanies, that's on view during our open hours through May 13th. Um, and with that, I will say uh, thank you to Jennifer and everyone who's been here, and please have a great night. Take care. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you.